Hello again and welcome to the first general session of the Fly ND Conference. We are excited and honored this morning to introduce to you Dick Van Grunsven, the founder of Vans Aircraft. We're greatly looking forward to hearing his story. Thanks for being here with us today, Dick, and it's off to you. Hi, uh, I'm Dick Van Grunsven, the founder of Vans Aircraft, and I'll be talking to you today a little bit about, um, well, kind of what, where we are, what Vans Aircraft is, uh, and um, I'll start off though with uh, a little bit of an introduction as to how this all originated. And um, uh, I was not an aviation family like some people are. However, it was a little aviation background. Picture her of my father in the mid thirties had learned to fly at a local airport, uh, more of a grass strip, really backyard compared to most of what we're familiar with today. And uh, he had learned to fly in this <clears throat> American Eaglet airplane. And I think uh, uh, soloed in something like four hours of dual, obviously not as uh, uh, complex a curriculum as we have now. And immediately they transferred him into this single seat home built, which was, um, uh, really a, a historic airplane in, in some ways, but uh, uh, an airplane that flew well on its homemade home engine. Um, Dad only flew a little. Depression days, ran out of money, was getting married, obviously trying to support both at the same time didn't work too well. However, uh, when I was young, myself and my a uh, slightly older brother were intrigued with aviation and his recollection of these days of flying really uh, impressed us and were embedded on us. So that and we became teenagers and my brother being older learned to fly. Fortunately, dad uh, was sympathetic. So went out and bought this <clears throat> J3 airplane that uh, we were able to fly from the, the, the farm, which was really our livelihood, very small farm in Western Oregon. Put in this airstrip, which was 650 feet long, perfect approaches, seems like more than adequate for a cub, which it, it was, but uh, that said, a lot of cub pilots probably couldn't manage it. Anyway, so, um, after a short while, decided the Cub was too slow and managed to buy, replace it with a Taylor Craft. And the Taylor Craft was not painted quite like this when we got it. My brother and I um, had to jazz it up a bit. And uh, for those of you that are, remember the 50s or the 60s, you had to, you had to, uh, well, particularly being teenagers, you had to add a little flash and pizzazz to something. So all of the checkerboard and such we added. The other I added was a set of wheel fairings. And you notice the white wall tires. Again, you have to be able to appreciate the, the appeal of that. The significance here, though, is that the wheel fairings are something that I made. Uh, made a mold, made fiberglass molds, got a, a supplemental type certificate on that at age 18 and uh, started manufacturing them. Uh, I only mention that it just gives a little bit of background as to the, you might say, entrepreneurial or engineering bent that I had at that time of just uh, starting my uh, engineering education at the University of Portland in Oregon. Uh, I went into the Air Force, I'd gone through the ROTC program, university, was not on pilot status, but um, I managed to <coughs> acquire a dismantled airframe from this old Stitz Playboy. It, uh, as I say, was non-flying, so I spent a year, year and a half restoring it to that configuration with a bubble canopy and a slick cowling and a, a 125 horsepower engine, which was a lot of power for that time. And gee whiz, a set of wheel fairings that look vaguely familiar to the ones we just saw. 
I had that airplane for a while. It flew well, had enough power to provide quite a bit of performance, but still not really what I realized was possible. So I designed and built a set of aluminum cantilever wings to replace the strut braced wings on uh, the original airplane. That then I renamed the RV-1 and um, uh, this photo was uh, several years further. I refined the cowling and a few other things got to this level, 1958, 1968 get my ear straight, 1968. An airline pilot in Texas wanted it real bad, so I sold it to him. It gave me an excuse to turn around and design a new airplane, the RV-3, based on that already successful airplane, but uh, with um, totally aluminum, not a hybrid anymore, all aluminum uh, wings, Basically what I had already developed, a new fuselage, tail surfaces, just overall refined. Um, every step along the way, the performance went up. And uh, one thing about this photo, we see that airplane that, that just uh, kind of, uh, uh, with the shape and all that speaks of speed, but parked at, a, at our short uh, farm runway. This, uh, I guess this is kind of the origin of the term total performance that we've used throughout uh, our, our uh, career at Vans Aircraft. And, but this is kind of how it all got started. Now, uh, with that as a background, we'll just kind of move, move into where we are today. And uh, this, more of the, the evolution of the Vans aircraft and our designs as we moved along. With me here is uh, Greg Hughes, who's uh, been with Vans for several years now, our head of marketing and things. Uh, pardon me for not knowing the exact title. They call me the director of everything else. The, right. <laughs> But um, basically put together this presentation uh, and uh, let him take a few slides here before um, I pick it up again. And folks will for apologize for the camera situation just because of current inoculation status and social distancing, you know, we're, we're staying a little bit of a bit apart here. So, um, but, you know, Vans Aircraft is approaching 50 years old. Van, I think the, the company was officially founded in well, it's either 72 or 73, depending on how you look at it. Well, the, the actual name was registered prior to that, but as far as starting to market plans and kits for airplanes, 1972-73 was about the era. So we're right, approaching 50 years. So, so Vans is a company that's been built on a strong, consistent tradition over that entire period of time and has grown. I know I started a few years ago and I think there were 65 or 68 employees when I joined total, and now we're close to 100. So the last few years have been very, very busy for us. And, you know, the, the RV aircraft line has really evolved and changed. And, you know, this, these are some slides that we often use at shows like Oshkosh or Sun and Fun and similar, but, you know, we've, 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 uh, the company has developed and Van has designed and, uh, and others, you know, with Van have designed, sure. you know, aircraft along the way, starting with that RV3. And, and in a little while, Van will go through the evolution of the different designs, but um, it's gone from single seat to two seat to side by side to uh, four seat uh, to light sport uh, and on and on. And the kits have really changed over time as well. But when people are thinking about the airplane and which one, which one really works well for them, we usually talk about it in terms of mission, right? What kind of flying are you looking to do? Some people want to go upside down. Others are really into flying formation. A lot of people kind of want a plane that will get them from here to there that they can have fun in, but then will also, you know, just reliably and quickly get them from one place to the other. Some folks just want to take an airplane every now and then. They just want to go up and fly around and you know, see oh, the changing mm -hmm. leaves or go to the coast or whatever, go, go fly over a hill. Or all of the above. Or all of the above. Total performance. And so the idea is, is that there really is an airplane for pretty much everybody um, in the fleet. 
So one of the things that people will usually consider is what do I really need in terms of what can go in the cabin? How many people need to fit in there? Is it, you know, is it one? Is it two? Is it four? Um, do I need, what do I need to take with me? How much stuff, baggage, uh, pets, a lot of people like to fly with their dogs and whatnot. So in the cabin requirements, is it a tandem or is it a side-by-side? -side? Do I really need four seats? How much, how much do I need to carry and what volume and weight is that is part of what goes into the conversation. Also, when thinking about mission, one of the key mission components is how far do I want to be able to go? Now, of course, you can go as far as you want if you're taking off and landing and putting fuel on. But as far as filling up with fuel and going nonstop, what do you, what do you have for requirements around that? And one of, the, one of the many aspects of total performance, again, is how far can I go? And how quickly can I get there? Um, another one is, do I, am I going to fly just as a day VFR pilot? If I'm a sport pilot, I'm flying day VFR. If I'm a private pilot, I might be flying day and night. I might or might not want to fly IFR. How do I want to equip the airplane? And also, how much do I want to spend in equipping the airplane? So we allow uh, a wide variety of choices and options when it comes to doing that. Um, really, for almost all of the kits, you have those choices that you can make. Then, as we mentioned, uh, aerobatics and going upside down uh, and things like formation flying um, and even putting formation and aerobatics together sometimes. There are quite a few really talented teams of individuals. Um, uh, this is pictures you're seeing here are a, a team from, from South America and they're just super talented and do really amazing stuff. And so we're really, we're really you know, excited and proud of the people that um, have taken taken RVs and done really cool things with them. Now, not everybody does this, but one mm -hmm. thing about the community and the RV community is that it's a very passionate community of people that build and fly um, our airplanes. So one of the big, there are a number of <clears throat> basically uh, never ending debates that go on uh, amongst airplane owners and especially RV owners. And one of them is tricycle versus tailgear. Another one would be uh, primer. Right? Do you prime or not prime or which primer do you use? Um, but uh, what it comes down to is it's a highly personal choice. Um, several of our models are available either as a conventional tail dragger gear style or as a tricycle gear airplane. Um, one of the, another of the total performance characteristics that um, really defines RVs is the fact that uh, generally speaking, they can go quite fast um, but they can also fly quite slow uh, and can can both take off and land in fairly short distances. Um, and that enables folks to be able to take their airplanes and go to short strips in Idaho, for example, or uh, to land on the grass strip on the farm mm -hmm. and to do those kinds of things. And especially as become, people become more and more proficient, um, then they have you know the, the ability to do that. And then the next one is ease of construction. You know, how, how difficult is it to put together the airplane? And forgive me, I'm gonna try to dismiss this thing. All right, there we go. Um, is, it, is it difficult to put together? Is it, is it relatively easy to put together? Um, you know, and, and how much time and what level of skill is required? Okay, well, maybe I'll... Um take up here a little bit. Um, well, we're, we're kind of starting at the end and working backwards, I guess. There's a representation of one of our current kits uh, and just uh, depicted in portions uh, so that um, you get an idea of, uh, of kind of the building progression, uh, the normal progression, starting with the uh, uh, empanage and tail group of the airplane, uh, it, it's a reasonable place to start because typically simpler components, less expensive, uh, uh, better better uh, uh, to make errors on small pieces than big pieces. It's just part of the learning process though that uh, normally uh, progress through the, the uh, airframe from the tail section to the wings, to the fuselage, to the power plant. And um, uh, again, that's, this has evolved over a, a, a lot of years and has proven to be an effective way to do it. 
uh, with the kits being available in the components sections, you don't have to pay for everything up front. You probably buy as you go, which obviously makes a lot of sense for a home builder uh, in that um, don't always have the budget to, one reason your own building is you don't have the budget to buy a ready to fly factory built airplane anyway. So it all meshes together pretty well in, in uh, concept and in realization. Backing up to our earlier designs, the RV3, 4, et cetera, uh, when we started, aircraft, as we know them now, didn't really exist. Most home-built airplanes were just built from blueprints or, or drawings and raw material. Uh, hard to imagine now, but hey, that's the way it was. A lot of the airplanes were simpler because the, while they had to be, uh, uh, working from raw material, it uh, is difficult to do a real complex airplane. Thus, though, as as we evolved initially, the plans I drew had to be uh, well mechanical drawings, uh, large prints, uh, usually uh, 24 by 36 size, with all of the detail that was needed to build the airplane from raw material if you chose. Uh, very soon after starting to market the airplane, and it, it, initially the single seat RV3, uh, we <coughs> developed a, a kit a package that had some of the components and basically all of the material and, and hardware necessary to do it. But still, the drawings had to be very detailed so that uh, uh, well, the builder could work from, from the very the basic kit. Uh, the plans have evolved over time as the, as the kits have evolved uh, in that um, the current kits have most of the components are, uh, completely built. So it's, it's more a matter of assembly than construction or uh, that, it, that it had been many years ago. Therefore, the plans have, have evolved to the point that they're more of assembly drawings without all of the, the detail and, and intricate dimensions necessary. So, and uh, a lot more detail uh, initially, things like the throttle assemblies were uh, kind of left up to the builder because he was sourcing in many cases, sourcing from the, the salvage yards and what have you. Now, uh, everything, uh, down, every component uh, down through all of the engine controls, et cetera, is provided with a kit. So we have very complete drawings showing all of the detail so that um, we can en ensure more consistency on all of the, the vital uh, components. The other over time, uh, the industry has evolved to the point that uh, kind of meeting uh, customer demand, the kits have been become more complete and to the point that some pre-assembly is done as much as uh, is permitted under FAA rules uh, to comply with the major portion uh, required for amateur built licensing. Uh, so we have what we call the, the uh, quick build kit, which uh, in the lower photograph shows the quick build versus the standard kit, the upper drawing in this case for the RV7. Pretty typical of all of our planes though, uh, all of the individual components as, as they're manufactured and supplied um, then uh, in the quick build kit, some of the assembly has been done again up through the, the uh, about the maximum permitted by um, FAA rules. The other is that uh, Vans Aircraft has evolved to providing builder support. Obviously, uh, good kits, good instructions are important, 
But building an airplane is a big job. I don't care how simple the airplane is or how good the kit is. Uh, a lot of times I like to compare it to an aircraft factory where the builder is really performing all of the work that the entire assembly staff at Cessna might be doing. So it's unreasonable that this person is going to be able to work through this process without some questions and some assistance. So we have uh, several people on the staff here at VANS that via email or telephone can answer questions, help people over little challenges they have. Uh, the people that, that we have on staff for that are all pilots. In most cases have built their own airplanes, so they're, they're well qualified to offer this sort of help. And the other, um, even though we may have had a, a kit on the market or online for a number of years, we are constantly upgrading as the opportunities uh, present themselves or as they're um, as we become aware of ways for making Im improvements. And so again, over that uh, almost 50 year period of time, we've uh, created a, a line of aircraft. We'll kind of go through now how some of this evolution came about. Um, we started out with a single seat RV3. I explained a little bit in the introduction how that came to be. And uh, primarily it was an, an airplane for myself that, that met the, as much as possible my um, desires in an airplane, uh, which were pretty broad. Uh, obviously I wanted a fast airplane for cross country really was into aerobatics, uh, had, had a background flying from uh, short strips on the farm, uh, keep being able to literally keep the airplane at home. Uh, a lot of uh, desirable features that, that I wanted, incorporated those as well as possible in, into this airplane. Uh, at that time, a lot of the home builds, the majority leading up to that had been single seat. So even though a single seat is now kind of the exception, uh, it was a reasonable starting point, both to keep the cost down, to keep the, the, the uh, assembly, the building time down, etc. cetera. Uh, it didn't take long. It obviously, uh, uh, the airplane was appealing. We had offered plans for it. And I mentioned within a couple of years, some form of rudimentary kits but almost immediately, of course, uh, people wanted more than one seat, which is understandable. It's kind of reluctant to, to do that because I uh, wasn't sure that we could, that I could um, retain the performance and all of the qualities in a bigger, heavier airplane. But at some point in the mid seventies and uh, started developing a two seat RV4, you can see the similarity between the two and it just made sense that if, if we knew what worked, we didn't stray too far from the well. We made the two seat as much of an expansion of the, its smaller predecessor. Fortunately, the, well, we mentioned before in the case of the RV3 that um, we had to provide uh, construction drawings for the airplane that, that had all of the detail necessary to, to build from raw material if desired or from the uh, basics that uh, were provided with the kit. Um, and, and that was pretty well true uh, through the, the, the uh, period that we had offered and uh, the RV4, the two place, by the way, it became much more popular than the single seat, which again, um, probably is understandable, but 
that brings us into the early 1980s. But uh, I guess if I wanted to sound like I'm complaining, as soon as we had that, then a lot of people wanted side by side. I was, again, uh, I had chosen the tandem configuration for the two seat just because I felt that it had the, the I could make the lightest airplane that way, the, the cleanest, the lowest drag and get the maximum performance. Uh, was concerned that with a side-by-side -side airplane, uh, at least some of the examples that were available at that time didn't really have the overall performance capability. There was felt there'd be, be too much of the sportiness and the ultimate performance lost. But that said, uh, after a few years realized that um, needed to give that a try because uh, of the uh, desirability and the uh, functionality of side-by-side -side seating. So we created the RV6 kind of pattern after the, the tandem RV4, but reconfigured fuselage. Technical difficulty. So then um, the initial was the RV6 uh, tail dragger uh getting into an era where uh, fewer and fewer pilots had uh, tail wheel experience um, they had not learned most had learned to fly in tri-gear airplanes and so uh, we developed the uh, I guess we didn't have it there the tricycle variant to the RV6 which we call the RV6A that established a pattern then of, um, of the tri gear models uh, variation of any of the designs then had the A designation. So that's the, um, the reason for that. The, the, eventually we um, uh, had really great success with the RV6, but um, as time moved on and um, we were able to make upgrades and other proposed upgrades, um, we developed the RV-7, which was overall a very similar configuration, very similar in size, but had offered a little more, more of everything really, a little more horsepower, higher horsepower option, a little more fuel, gives you more range, but primarily we were making upgrades in the, uh, the design, the, the actual construction of the airplane or the, the uh, kits themselves. We were able to manufacture components to a more complete degree, making it easier to uh, assemble uh, the airplane. So, uh, we, we created the, the new designation rather than just uh, an altered designation. Uh, the RV-7 was really the first kit that we had that offered what is now uh, commonplace for mo all of our newer designs, which is matched hole construction. Thus all of the pieces with hole with uh, rivet holes, attached holes, already in place so that it, it really became more of a uh, function of um, assembling the airplane than, than fabricating uh, as it had been in the earlier days. So this, this is really um, what set, uh, well, a new course for our company that, um, that we were able to offer that and the seven was the, the first model. And uh, it seemed like with, uh, with each upgrade, it uh, just enhanced the appeal and the market, uh, market segment for the aircraft. When we did the side-by-side -side RV-6, it immediately became more popular. It almost put our tandem RV-4 out of business. And uh, it was seemed obvious that maybe that was the future, forget about the tandem airplane, but I still had a kind of a warm spot in my heart for the, the tandem arrangement. Uh, it uh, liked the idea of centerline seating for doing aerobatics and 
formation and such. Um, so this was about the mid nineties, I guess. Uh, one of the appeal of the side-by-side -side airplane was just more, more better cabin uh, ambiance, comfort, space, etc. And uh, the RV4 had been designed way back in the mid seventies. Expectations were a little different. People were a little more willing to um, compromise space and such uh, for, well, the sportiness of the airplane. Really, the, the thought behind the RV-8 was to, to take a tandem configuration and incorporate as much space and uh, cabin uh, comfort as possible. We did that. Very glad we did because the airplane, while never achieving the bestseller status, has gained a, a real solid following and just it just uh, remains um, a, a popular airplane. The one thing about the, the RV-8 is that it actually preceded the, uh, it came on the market before we had completely evolved the matched hole uh, manufacturing capability. But over time, we upgraded uh, the airframe so that it, uh, like now, like the RV-7 and uh, 10 and 14, does have a, a complete matched hole tooling for uh, ease of assembly. The RV-9 is, uh, I don't know what you can, not a stepchild necessarily, but one that uh, came into being in the late 1990s. And kind of the thought behind it was uh, our other airplanes, the RV-4, particularly the, the RV-6, were sometimes seen to be a little bit more challenging to fly than the trainers that people had learned in. Not necessarily hard, but uh, quicker, uh, quicker response rates and uh, lighter controls uh, just took a little bit more um, adaptation, I guess, uh, to, to fly well. The idea between the nine was, for the nine was to make it an airplane that flew more like a trainer. It had a little lower landing speed. Um, and initially the thought really was to fly on lower power, um, both for uh, less expensive and uh, burning less fuel. So we uh, took the fuselage from well, almost the same as an RV-6 and uh, incorporated a longer, narrower wing with a better flap and reduced the stall speed by six or seven mile an hour, which in the real world makes it feel like you're flying at half the speed. You just have a lot better reaction times and such. Um, as it turned out, the while we had a 118 horsepower Lycoming 0235 in the prototype. That's really what uh, the airplane was designed for uh, with 160 horse upper limit. Um, turns out that people want more performance and are willing to spend more money, et cetera, than uh, I sometimes thought. So it's become the more popular engine for that uh, airframe. And again, it uh, was a non-aero because of the longer wing uh, was, and, and just the, the mission of the airplane was not intended to be aerobatic. So it doesn't have aerobatic strength and more of a, uh, just an ease of flying entry level type airplane. It has uh, had a steady following over the years and uh, well, as with the rest of our airplanes, found uh, uh, a real market niche. This airplane differed a bit and had a uh, unique a proprietary airfoil that was designed by uh, aerodynamicist John Rontz to try and achieve the, the best qualities for the specific mission of, of that airplane. One of the... Uh, request we'd had for many, many years was a four-seat airplane, kind of along the lines of uh, more is better in, in all respects. We kind of hesitated because 
for a couple of things. One, uh, all of our two-seat sporty airplanes were really filling a, a void in the market. The, the factories had never really built any airplanes, any significant number of, of high-performance sporty two-seat airplanes. Four-seat airplanes, uh, pilots had a, a choice of a, quite a number of, of good performing, used, affordable four-seat airplanes. Also, we knew uh, more than a lot of prospective builders do, that building a bigger airplane was going to be more of a challenge and that uh, it was uh, going to be an obstacle. However, uh, as we evolved into the, the ability to uh, simplify the construction through the matched hole tooling that we've uh, incorporated in the kits. That along with just uh, the fact that the used airplanes were getting more used and less available. In um, 2003, we uh, test flew the prototype of the RV-10 four seat uh, airplane with designed primarily around the uh, Lycoming uh, IO540 260 horse engine. Turned out to be a, a, a very capable airplane. Again, we had a proprietary airfoil used on the wing that uh, intended to offer the, the best performance for a high speed um, load carrying airplane. And uh, as indicated here, you know, the, the kit had matured to the point that we had all pre-punched matched hole tooling um, and the instructions for this airplane then we evolved away from the large uh, uh, mechanical drawings or so-called blueprints to uh, instructions that were more suited strictly for assembly, more of a step-by-step, -step, uh, all of the, the drawings and the text uh, accompanying side by side on, on the plans. And um, the, the, I forgot to mention that in the case of the, the RV-7, that the big uh, advantage in building was that unlike the prior airplanes, you didn't need assembly fixtures or jigs to haul all the pieces together as you uh, fitted and drilled and riveted the skin. So that, uh, that was a, a big advantage that you basically can assemble all of the, well, basically hundreds of, of pieces and they self-aligned because of the accuracy at which we were able to uh, pre-punch and um, form all of the parts. Following that, or actually uh, during the time that we we're developing uh, the RV-10 and um, while well, updating our manufacturing capability, the light sport uh, licensing category came into being. We kind of did not get in on absolutely the ground floor because we were busy with other things, but uh, as we found time uh, subsequent to developing uh, the RV-10 and upgrading everything else, that um, we uh, mm -hmm designed the RV-12 light sport uh, to give that a try. It's a little different in that we obviously, uh, with the light sport category, as most people know, there are limits on weight and speed uh, primarily so that we designed the airplane so that uh, it would be as easy to build as possible, require less tooling than the others, thus uh, the primary Structure is all uh, fastened together with pop rivets, blind rivets, rather than typical AN rivets. Um, initially, the RV-12, had we designed it around the Rotax 912 100 horsepower engine. And after a few years, uh, Rotax had developed the fuel injected, electronically managed uh, 912 IS engine so that we in, uh, redesigned the airplane to use that engine, a, a bigger um, 
not necessarily compromise, but uh, adaptation than, than one might imagine, even though it was the same basic engine. So we did that. Uh, it required a number of changes in, in the, the fuselage and uh, other things we'd learned. We um, incorporated other upgrades into what is now the RV-12-912 IS. Uh, kind of a, a long, the, during the same time that we're upgrading the, the RV-12, we developed an RV-14. Well, the, the 14 looks a lot like the seven uh, in the background in this picture. And a lot of people ask us why we did that, why we made another airplane, we already had a, a successful line. Part of it was that nothing is ever as perfect as we would like. And um, one of the things with the RV-10 that people, or four seat that people really liked, we had great uh, cabin space. It was really more spacious than we had even intended. The uh, outward view, the, the field of view was superb to almost anything we had. So uh, a lot of people said, man, I, I really like the RV-10, but I don't need four seats. So the idea here was to upgrade a two seat uh, uh, configuration to incorporate as many of the um, features that people found desirable in the larger airplane. So that there's definitely a, a similarity um, that, that, that the, uh, uh, the RV-10 definitely inspired this airplane. And um, it has, uh, uh, along with continual upgrades in the, the kit, even though, hey, it's matched whole just like its predecessor, it's still in detail superior. Every uh, new airplane we've come out with has been superior in little ways, little ways that just too uh, involved to, to properly um, describe. So it's made it a, already a, a very popular airplane, uh, easier to build, uh, more consistent, um, you know, more utility, uh, all of the above. And uh, as already mentioned, uh, as time goes on, we, we both be through our own um, uh, intuition and uh, input from our customers from the field, we come up with uh, ideas for making upgrades and improvement, which is uh, uh, always important. Uh, safety has always been a concern of ours. Uh, obviously, it should be with anybody flying, but within home-built aircraft, they historically were not always viewed as being the safest way to get into the air. Uh, from our perspective, it's like, well, why not? Why can't they be? So that's been our, our goal all along is to make a, an airplane that has uh, safe flying qualities as well as uh, uh, the structural integrity, all of the above. Um, the other that, that we have been able to emphasize and, and uh, support is um, the idea of uh, training, a transition training so that people can move into this airplane uh, rather than just blindly as, as had been done in the past, particularly with single seat airplanes. And uh, get better acclimated to the airplane so that they don't uh, don't bend things on their first flights. Um, this is an example of um, continuing refinement uh, is a power plant on the RV-14 shown here. The, that airplane had um, a larger, a higher horsepower engine uh, limit or specification than our prior two-seat airplanes. But um, even beyond that, though, over time, uh, Lycoming uh, has improved their 0390 injected engine 
And uh, engine is part of it, and engine installation is another part uh, of the formula so that we're able to really optimize the installation to get better performance out of that airplane around the, the top of the line engine. Um, just more detail on um, getting the performance uh, out of the engine was the incorporation of a, a little larger um, air body for the fuel injection system, which permitted the engine to breathe a little better, develop a little more power. Exhaust system, that's part of the engine breathing formula. Uh, air's gotta come in and go back out and you make that whole process as efficient as possible. And um, the engine cowling is part of the formula also because you gotta move cooling air around that engine and it takes uh, energy to do that. The better that can be managed, the lower the drag and thus the higher the performance. Overall, um, our engineering team really excelled in this, uh, ex not experiment, but this, in that we picked up, and maybe you can correct me on this, Greg, about 13 mile an hour. 13 miles an hour. On exactly. speed. Yep. Speed is hard to come by um, in the real world. Uh, I should pick on Greg as an advertising guy that, <laughs> it's easy to come by speed. You just sharpen your pencil or, but in, in the real world, um, to gain 13 mile an hour on this airplane, if you did it with horsepower alone, it would take around 50 horsepower to gain that speed. The engine, we had only five horsepower more specified. Real world, we got more than a five horsepower boost with that installation. But a lot of the, the benefit there was uh, refinement in uh, the other details I, I just mentioned here, the engine cooling. Uh, this drawing shows a, a cowl flap uh, down in the, in the lower right that is a cowl flap or a, a cooling flap, I should say, incorporated in a cooling tunnel in the fuselage, not just a flap on the cowling as is often seen that can be closed in flight to reduce the drag and uh, well, achieve the speed gain that we found possible. Uh, oil cooling uh, changes improvements made there to uh, keep this high output engine cool. Uh, the future of vans, well, who knows? We just keep <laughs> keep doing what uh, what we uh, have evolved over the years and just improving upon it. Uh, there's, uh, as I kind of referenced before, we had achieved matched hole uh, tooling and assembly some years ago, but we continue to upgrade that and and to make it even easier. Such as I think I missed one of the points on the slide here that we got it so accurate that we end up now with final sized holes, not just approximations that have to be reamed to final fit. And, and also so accurate with final size holes that if you ordered a part on an RB14 four years ago and you wanted to replace that part today and you ordered it, uh, the one that we ship you today would fit exactly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah no, it's, uh, they're, they're just, and going back to personally, or to my uh, design and manufacturing experience almost 50 years ago, I can't keep up with all of this. It's just uh, the young engineers have had, I've just had to stand back and let them do their thing with all of the magic tools that they have available now. But we will continue to work with that, uh, both uh, from design and manufacturing uh, perspectives to just make the best product available. Uh, making a, this has always been a factor on, on home built aircraft, coming up with a final product that, that performs well, et cetera, is only part of it. The big part of it is that it has to be 
something that a reasonable person in the field can can build. So that that almost it really is the bigger challenge than than designing a good airplane is designing a good kit. An oh, example here of, of the cowling I made reference to before, with the the uh, accuracy they're able to achieve in the, the uh, development of the tooling for that, it just makes it often on on cowlings and such pieces. There's a lot of cut and fit necessary, and we've minimized that uh, really really to the benefit of the builder because not only does it take time, but it's often frustrating. And if you're cutting and fitting fiberglass pieces of a cowl, you can overdo it, <laughs> et cetera. So all of this is taking as much of the guesswork out of the process as possible. Uh, another new tool, finite element analysis from the engineering standpoint, you can put a, a the computer sees this stuff in three dimensions. You can input known forces and loads in the computer, you can see this part actually bending and moving as uh, it would in, in service. So you can see where the high stress areas are. We're able to, to use this to manufacture parts that are going to hold up over time and, and uh, give the, the consistent strength that we need. Uh, testing, uh, shown here, doing load testing on, on a wing. Um, it's a very involved process, really. Often we're used to seeing pictures of airplanes being tested with big stacks of sandbags, which is okay, but this is uh, with the shot bags and showing here a fuselage in, in, at an attitude similar to what a high um, pull-up stress load would be. Another uh, picture drop test of... Uh, on the landing gear, uh, well, we repeated that many, many times. RV-14 in this case, and the 14 has really been designed to FAR Part 23 standards. In other words, the same standards that manufactured airplanes. We don't have that Part 23 certification because um, designing and testing to that is one thing, convincing the FAA is another thing, a very expensive time consuming process. Picture here showing uh, airflow tough testing, another valuable tool that we've been able to use as well as a lot of builders is the video camera technology available now. And uh, that um, I can way back when the only way we had to take a picture like this was to fly real close to the other guy and it didn't work that well. This though, if you notice uh, all of the tough tests on the lower fuselage of the RV-14 are pretty straight, indicating that really done a good job of uh, controlling the airflow and minimizing the drag. I guess, hey, that's just about the end of it. Um, well, as the slide says, do you have any questions or do you have the answers for us? All right, so I have a question coming in from Mike, and he says, does Vans Aircraft have any educational programs available for EAA chapters, schools, etc., to get students building components as a way of introducing aircraft maintenance and engineering to students? Uh, Vans Aircraft doesn't have anything uh, specific to that. Uh, there may be little, uh, such a program is really pretty involved. We have been involved, I personally have been involved. Uh, we initiated a project here oh, about 10 years ago where uh, along with the um, RV-12 Light Sport, which is uh, the best product we have for uh, entry level builders started a project working with high school kids along with a, a local nonprofit aviation education related nonprofit building a complete RV12 with a, with a volunteer group of high school kids and we've done I think we're finishing our sixth airplane right now with that many successive classes and um, this concept has been used, copied by quite a number of other uh, groups around the country. So it's pretty successful. 
Vans Aircraft supports that by offering discounts to the, the qualifying uh, student groups that, that are doing it. Um, not, not to my knowledge, any real package that we can send out. You might refer, Greg, to the, to the other uh, practice kits that we have. Sure, we do have certain kits which are great for doing the initial learning. Um, there's like a small airfoil design, some other sheet metal uh, practice. There's a great weekend project where you can build kind of like a internally lit sign, with the Vans aircraft logo on it. Those are all good learning for families and whatnot. We also on our website have a STEM, science, technology, education, math, education page, the, the team flight program that started here a little over 10 years ago that Van's involved in that he mentioned, um, spawned a whole bunch of additional similar programs. And there have been right around a hundred or so kits ordered and either finished or being built right now, Army 12s around the world being built by teenagers. And so there's links to some of those programs that are on that page. So while we don't have a specific curriculum that we've developed, there are a number of organizations out there that have and that are willing to share that curriculum and are also are able to help facilitate builds at schools for some of the organizations and other organizations, maybe outside of schools. Other questions? No, sir. That'll be all I have for you. Pardon me? That was it. Really? Well, e either I put a lot of people to sleep <laughs> or we answered the question so thorough, covered it so thoroughly, there aren't any more. The one thing that we didn't, I didn't emphasize a whole lot, and Greg is a little more familiar with, and that's the the whole RV community, the whole, um, I don't know any better way to describe it than that fraternity or brotherhood or sisterhood. Um, any further comments about what we're doing to promote that? Well, I think, you know, when we talk about the Vans Aircraft family, of course, we talk about our business. We're a relatively small business, right? And, and quite close, but the Vans Aircraft family really extends to everyone who builds and flies the airplanes. And when you go to an airport, uh, it's not uncommon at all to see one or more RVs. Some airports you go to, and there's close to a hundred RVs, literally. Um, so there's a real um, brotherhood and sisterhood, sort of a family atmosphere, you know, among the people that build and fly the airplanes. And it's something that we're uh, both really happy and excited to be part of and also really proud of. Um, and so what that really means for somebody who maybe hasn't built an airplane but wants to is that there's a lot of people out there who are both very capable and more than willing to help answer questions or come and look at a project or drive rivets or do a variety of things. So it's, uh, you know, the, the community is, you know, half of what's driven vans over the last 50 years. Um, you know, they're, and that's because they're really cool, really fun, uh, amazing airplanes, but, you know, the, but it, a, a common person, a typical person can pick up the tools, learn how to use them, put them together, join the family and be part of a community that, um, that fundamentally really transforms and changes people's lives once they get really involved. Yeah, and this this uh, has been around in aviation before Vans Aircraft. I mean, the Bonanza Society, uh, the, the Cub Air Forces that develop at different places, et cetera. But uh, it just seems that we've been able to attract builders that, that really want to, that have the community spirit, really want to help each other etc. And um, I guess we're kind of running out of time now. Hopefully that you've uh, enjoyed this. I've really enjoyed the opportunity to, to speak to you. And uh, you know, just that uh, um, look into our airplanes. Uh, if it seems like it's something that you'd want to be involved in, uh, give us a call. Greg is all ready to talk to you here. So uh, we'll uh, call it a day. Thanks for listening.